All right, welcome back. Um, so we're going to actually talk about some of the different synovial joints in our bodies. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the structures. And again, you're going to ho ho hopefully this will help reinforce um, just exactly how some of those actions are occurring. We're going to make it a little bit more obvious. All right, trying to advance this slide, and I'll hide me. Um, so here we have an example of what's known as a planner joint. Um, so we, again, we had mentioned that the, the bones in your tarsals, they'll uh, show gliding type of movement. So this is the bones in your ankle. You see side to side movement only. Um, these bone surfaces are flat or slightly curved, which makes sense because again, you have this gliding kind of movement back and forth against one another. Not a ton. I mean, obviously like your foot doesn't all of a sudden just kind of 90 degree angle on itself, but there is a little bit of um, movement in those joints. So these will be the joints, again, in either your wrist, so intercarpal joints, so the, between the carpal bones, intertarsal joints, so those joints in your ankle, um, between the sternum and the clavicle, and maybe that's a little bit even more of an obvious one. Um, so as, and you can kind of even kind of bring me back for a second so I can show you this. So basically, uh, you can even put your, like, it's kind of hard to show you recording. So if you put your, you know, here's your clavicle, Here's your sternum. You can even, you know, as you raise your arm, you can feel like how that sternum just glides slightly against, the clavicle glides slightly against that sternum. So, you know, it allows you to raise your arm. Like if it didn't, if it was stiff, you wouldn't be able to raise your shoulder up that high. You'd probably only be able to do this. Okay. Um, and then also between uh, the actual vertebra and then uh, your uh, yeah, vertebra and actually your ribs in the back, there's a little bit of movement. And that also helps, you know, with like the stretching of your rib cage as you're breathing, particularly during real heavy breathing when you have sort of that <gasps> the real labored breathing. You can actually feel your ribs moving. You can probably even feel sometimes like when your back's stiff and you kind of twist yourself and feel a little like pop in the back. A lot of times that's that vertebral costal joint. Okay. All right, hide me again here. Um, so let's see. So a hinge joint is it's it is what it sounds like so like a door hinge right um, classic things are like your elbow um, your knee um, between the tarsal and your uh, uh, I'm sorry your, your talus and your tibia is going to be sort of a hinge joint the joints in between your phalanges so in your fingers the bones in, the, in your fingers um, <clears throat> again basically like a hinge joint here you're seeing it between the humerus and the ulna. Here's that trochlea. Here's trochlear notch. And again, so it provides sort of an anterior posterior movement, right? So flexion, extension, and in some cases, hyperextension. It just depends on the actual structure of the joint. We had mentioned um, uh, rotation. Remember, rotation is different than circumduction, right? Rotation is that smaller kind of. Uh, well, I guess rotational turning movement. Um, so you, the radius and ulna are, are again the classic ones of this as well. Um, so you can see how that round head of the radius will allow it to basically rotate around the surface, that radial notch uh, in the ulna. Okay. Uh, in in that case, in that proximal radial proximal radial ulnar joint, so the one that's closest to your elbow. It allows for supination pronation. That's what actually allows for that motion to happen. If this joint fuses, and sometimes when people break their elbows, depending on where that break is, um, sometimes they can cause fusion in this area, um, and they can't can't either entirely, or they do not have the range of motion for supination pronation that they once did. Another example of a pivot joint is the one between your atlas and your axis. So if you remember the atlas was the first C1 vertebra and the axis was a C2 vertebra. Um, the dens of the axis allows uh, the atlas to slip past it, to rotate past it. That's what allows your head to go side to side so you go no with your head. And that's what's happening. Um, ellipsoidal joints, same thing as a condylar joint. Um, so basically you have an oval shaped projection and an oval shaped depression. So you can have uh, flexion, extension, uh, abduction, adduction. So if we can have all of these 
Um, you can also have some circumduction occurring. Um, so again, here your wrist, and right here, and then also the metacarpophalangeal joint. Okay, so I'll kind of bring you back again. So remember, here's your hand. Here are your metacarpals. Here are your phalanges. So that metacarpal phalangeal joint is right here. So you can basically, so it's kind of here. So you can flex, extend your fingers. You can adduct, abduct your fingers, and you can also make them go in a circle. So you allow circumduction to occur as well. You're like, woo, so crazy, right? Because you're doing a circumduction, right? All because of this condylar or condyloid or or ellipsoidal joint. So you, you notice that that was only uh, joints two through five because your thumb is actually a very specific joint. It's a saddle joint. Okay, and it's called that because someone, in this image I think it's a little more obvious, so someone thought it looked like a person sitting in a saddle. So if this was the saddle and here's a person that likes to be kind of hanging off. Anyway, it allows for circumduction. So basically it's going to allow for flexion extension, but it also allows for opposition. So that's what makes it slightly different. It's a slightly different structure and also allows opposition to occur. Okay. Hiding. Um, and then ball and socket joints, I think that's fairly straightforward. You have a ball, you have a socket, they fit into one another. <laughs> we saw that um, in our shoulder between the humerus uh, and the glenoid cavity of the scapula. And then we see that in the hip between the head of the femur and then the acetabulum on, on the os coxa. Right? And we have lots of different uh, motions. Because it's round, it allows for a lot of different motions. So we have flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Sometimes we also have circumduction. We also have rotation. So it's a very mobile joint. All right. So we're going to talk about different joints of the body then. So we're just going to highlight some of these. You would have seen these uh, in lab as well. All right. Um, temporal mandibular joint. Um, you, you probably have heard of TMJ. Someone has TMJ. What they're talking about is a temporal mandibular joint. Right. Um, it is a synovial joint. Okay. There is an articular, what's known as an articular disc. It's made of fibrocartilage. So if you take a look here, so here's our, our temporal mandibular joint. You'll notice there are these ligaments holding your mandible in place. So, and then you can see the, the actual synovial cavity. And you have something called an articular disc that's splitting that cavity into sort of two, I guess, subcompartments, two compartments in that cavity. You have a superior compartment because it's on top, inferior compartment below. Okay. Um, and that's what's going to allow, remember, your mandible can do elevation, depression, protraction, retraction. So that um, depression, elevation, those are uh, hinge movements. Right? So depression, elevation, those are hinge movements. Protraction, retraction, those are gliding movements. And it's basically this disc and those two different compartments that will allow for, that, for those different movements to occur. Um, and then here's, here are just some, here's an example of some of the other ligaments that you might see. You don't have to like, learn these or anything. I just wanted to give you an idea of sort of what that styloid process even did. Give you an idea of how your, your jaw is actually attached uh, to the rest of your cranium. All right. Um, so here we have our, our shoulder joint, right? We have the head of the humerus uh, joining in with that glenoid cavity or, or glenoid fossa, the scapula, again, ball and socket joint. All types of movement are possible, as we just saw a second ago. Um, I have the ligaments that you're required to know in lab highlighted for you. So let's just kind of go over those really fast. Um, you have that coracoid process, and then here's your part of your clavicle. They've cut part of it. The ligament that goes between the coracoid process of the scapula and the clavicle is simply called the coracoclavicular ligament. Right? Hopefully that's easy enough. You had the acromion process, um, and then the clavicle. So you have acromioclavicular ligament right here. You have the coracoid process, the acromion process. You have the coracoacromial ligament. So basically, it's just telling you where it's going from and to. So that's what those names are. You have one that's going from the basically what's the base of that coracoid process. So it's kind of coming from here to the humerus coracohumeral ligament. You have other ones that are going basically just to the 
inside, I guess, just deep to uh, the, the glenoid uh, fossa. They're going to the humerus, and sort of a larger band of ligaments. Those are called glenohumeral ligaments. Basically, all of those are making sure that the head of that humerus is staying in that joint. Um, let's see if you can see it on this image. Um, <clears throat> you have, you see this term right here, the glenoid labrum. Okay. Uh, you do because if you remember back to what you saw in lab, uh, those really the scapula that that fossa that glenoid cavity really isn't very deep either. So what you have here, you don't really have a, what's known as a meniscus, but you do have a, a, basically a, what's called a labrum. You do have this cartilaginous ring uh, around the very edge, also making that socket a little bit deeper, so the head of the the humerus isn't just slip right off your scapula because you don't want to like, constantly dislocate your shoulder. That'd be terrible. Um, similarly, we're going to see, I think we saw this a little while ago too, um, you'll see bursa, um, again, making sure that those, those tendons um, are, are moving smoothly when we have muscle contractions. Um, there's, so that, again, there's lots of different ligaments trying to strengthen that capsule because the bony connection is not particularly deep. Um, then you also have something called the transverse humeral ligament. I just kind of want to bring that to your attention. What we see here is a tendon of the biceps muscle um, running through through uh, the space right underneath it. So that kind of holds the the the, um, the tendon on the sorry holds the bicep tendon in place. So every time you move your bicep, that tendon just doesn't pop out on you. Um, you certainly do not need to memorize these different ligaments. I just wanted to give you an idea uh, that there are lots of different ligaments uh, making up that capsule and the elbow as well. Um, a lot of the arrangements that we see here are going to be very similar to what we'll actually see in the knee. I mean, obviously it's a little bit specialized. However, th there is some um, analogous structures. So we'll see something like the radial collateral ligament. We'll have an ulnar collateral ligament. We'll see those collateral ligaments in the knee as well, for example. So here we have our hip joint. So now we have something that's going to be much more uh, structurally sturdy um, based on bone structure. So there's a much deeper socket in the acetabulum. Um, however, you will still have what's known as the acetabular labrum. So you still have a little bit of cartilage that's going to to extend that capsule to make it just that much deeper. I'm sure I should sorry, that capsule, that socket that much deeper. Um, just so again, that the head of that femur can sit in there nice and sturdy. Uh, again, all types of movements are going to be possible. And what I've, I've done here is, again, I've, I've highlighted some of the ligaments that you can see that you also need to know uh, for lab. So coming from the pubic bone to the femur, you have this pubofemoral ligament. And then coming from that, from the ilium um, down to the femur, you have the iliofemoral ligament. And then here, in, so here's just another view of that. And then here in the back, going from the ischium, we have the ischiofemoral ligament. Okay. Very strong ligaments, very large ligaments, lots of structural reinforcement. Because one of the things you do not want to have happen is your leg to dislocate on you when you're trying to run away from something, right? So it's one, it can be one of these very, it's a very strong structure in the body. And it's a, it's a pretty, not to say it's impossible, but it's a fairly catastrophic accident that will cause a, a, a hip to be displaced. Okay. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, what hip fractures and what we actually mean by those in, in a second. So we have the tibiofemoral joint, so it's between the femur and the tibia, by definition. Um, the patella also will be sitting in the front here, again, protecting all of these structures that would normally be exposed as soon as we flexed our leg, right? It's a hinge joint. There's a gliding joint, so that's another great example of a gliding joint between the patella and the femur, and I think that's pretty obvious how the patella would just simply glide along the, the anterior surface of the femur. Now there's... I think so obviously as a glide as I'm sorry as a hinge joint we have flexion and extension when you flex your knee okay so, um, 
what you'll end up seeing is that you can slightly rotate the tibia. Okay, so again, that's sort of like the, that no kind of movement. Um, that you can actually get a slight little rotation on the tibia. Not a lot, but some. Okay. And then we have these meniscus building up that joint as well, making that socket slightly deeper, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so here's a, a superior view of the knee. Um, so you can see the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus, again, making that socket a little bit deeper. Um, <clears throat> so here you're seeing, so this is the front, this is the back. Here's a posterior cruciate ligament. Here's the anterior cruciate ligament. Okay. All of those things making your knee structure just that much more sturdy. Um, I, I forget who it is. There's actually there's two different athletes, one in the NFL and one in um, oh, the NBA. And I forget who they are. Uh, what's interesting is uh, they both, at different times, um, got in, in their careers. They're very successful individuals, and I, I do forget who it was, but um, they, they got injured, their knees got injured, and so they had to go in and get an MRI done and you know get it looked at. And the doctors were surprised to find that these individuals did not have an anterior cruciate ligament at all. Um, and so they were like, how is that possible? Because basically, if you damage your ACL, you're out. You cannot play. You do not have stability in your knee. And what they think happened to these, again, two different individuals just happened to have the same sort of thing, was that when they were kids, they probably damaged that ACL. You know, you know how kids are. They kind of rough and tumble. Um, and they, it never got fixed properly, but because it happened when they were so young, that all the muscles and all the other ligaments around their knee were able to compensate for that. So all the other ligaments were, were, were larger and stronger and st helped stabilize that knee. Um, just absolutely fantastic when you think about just how term plastic or, or malleable the body is, particularly when we're young, and how it can compensate for deficiencies. And as we get older and our bodies are more set in their structure, we have less of an ability to, to compensate for particularly large-scale damage like that. Um, however, anyway, I thought that was kind of a, a neat little story. And maybe you, if you guys come across um, on a news feed or if you Google it, um, who those individuals were, let me know so I can, I can post that. All right. So some of the things that will affect the range of motion at, at these joints um, so, well, for one, the shape of the actual bones coming together, right? So one of the things that will be pretty obvious, I mean, if you have, you know, a, a one uh, bone that's like this and the other one is like this, right, depending on that shape, if all I can do is a back and forth hinge movement, sort of like um, the ulna and then the humerus, right? versus a ball and socket, you're going to have a lot more movement. So that so just the actual shape of the bones will, will factor in. How tight your ligaments are, right? So you know you've seen people, some uh, like ballet dancers and stuff are very limber, right? Those ligaments are very loose. They're able to have a lot more flexibility versus someone who doesn't really stretch or has really tight ligaments. They're going to be pretty stiff when they walk. They're probably even more prone to, to injuries. So that'll also affect the range of motion that they have at their joint. The arrangement and tension of the muscles will affect, will affect it too. Um, so basically, like I don't know if you've ever had this, but if you have like a muscle spasm, or you have a muscle that's contracting, you won't be able to have quite the same range of motion that you once had. Like if you have a muscle that's inflamed or something like that, there's no way. I mean, you're stiff, right? You just do not have the range of motion. Um, you've probably have had that experience, like you decide, like, hey, I'm going to the gym and I'm going nuts because I feel great, and then the next day you're like. Oh, so sore and you're like no one touch me and you can it's, it's hard to walk and you're really just stiff right um there's contact of soft parts as well so you've, you've probably seen this like so i'm just going to kind of so like, kind of use me as an example i do not have giant biceps um by any stretch um so right i've, I've got a good range of motion if you see some of those big real like big muscle builder dudes right and their biceps are right here they can't move past that because the biceps are actually in the way. So they'll have less of a range of, of motion. So the actual contact of soft parts. Um, different hormones, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, there's a hormone called relaxin, R-E-L-A-X-I-N, -R um, and that is produced particularly in women uh, during uh, pregnancy 
um, it'll increase throughout pregnancy and really spikes toward the end. And that will actually help relax um, tendons and ligaments in the body, again, with the, with the idea that that pubic synthesis needs to kind of come apart a little bit so that the baby's head can uh, get through safely. So different hormones will also affect um, basically the tautness of ligaments and tendons. And then disuse. You know, if, if you're kind of just, again, kind of sitting there, not stretching, you don't exercise, you don't stretch, you don't use it, you will be stiff. Right? Um, it's actually easier for you to stretch if you've warmed up a little bit. So there's that. So those are the different factors. Hide me so you can see this. So things you get to look forward to. Um, just like everything else in the body, as you get older, the production of synovial fluid decreases. Um, the cartilage doesn't repair itself as it once did, so it thins out. It's worn away. Um, the ligaments lose their flexibility as well as their length. So older individuals, if they're not constantly aware of this and constantly doing something about it, um, you know, their ligament length, and they're, they're kind of stiffer. They don't have that range of motion that younger people have. Um, and usually, usually they wake up with aches and, and pains uh, simply due to like less synovial fluid and then thinner cartilage helping to cushion that joint. A lot of the effects of aging are part of it will be due to genetics. Some people are very flexible and limber well into their 60s and 70s. Um, you may have seen uh, videos on you know YouTube about that. Um, and then the other factor is simply wear and tear. Um, again, you look at some of these athletes, and when we watch them on TV, they look like they're in amazing shape. We watch them in the Olympics; they're in amazing shape. Um, but these the joints on these people are really damaged. I mean, they're they're after a game or after practice, they're sitting in ice baths, they're getting ice packed on them to help with the swelling that's actually occurring. And a lot of them, by the time, you know, they're, to be honest, most, most athletes probably have se severe damage by the time they get to college. So those, those folks that are trying to get inside the, the, the leagues, probably by the time they hit college, definitely after college, have enough wear and tear on their joints, but they're probably experiencing um, symptoms of, of arthritis. Um, so, so just some terms for you. Uh, arthroscopy is simply the examination of a joint. Usually these days it's done with a, with a tiny little instrument. Um, things that, uh, these sort of diagnostic tools in medicine have gotten very sophisticated and, and much smaller these days. Obviously the smaller the incision you make, the, the easier the recovery is and the less damage there is. Anyway, so things that they might use is they might use arthroscopic instruments to remove knee cartilage, repair smaller ligaments. Again, the idea is being as, as least intrusive as possible. Sometimes you will have to totally replace a joint. Um, so you have either partial, what's known as partial hip replacement or total hip replacement. Um, so basically in a total hip replacement, you actually replace the acetabulum as well as the head of the femur. In a partial hip replacement, it's one or the other. Usually have a um, plastic socket metal head, although these days, again, that these things will change as um, newer and newer techniques uh, and better techniques are discovered. Um, and obviously knee replacements are fairly common. And you can either have knee replacements with, again, sort of metal and uh, even Teflon pieces, some plastic pieces, or sometimes you may even have partial knee replacements, full knee replacements. Sometimes the parts may even come from a cadaver. It just depends on like what the injury is, what the surgery is, um, basically what your lifestyle is, how old you are even. Sometimes they won't, even though you know someone who's in their 40s may be a candidate for knee replacement, sometimes they'll try to hold it off as long as possible because these replacements don't last forever. And if you're in your 40s, you probably will live at least another 40 years. And you may end up having to have a knee replacement every 10 years, at least with the technology we have today. So you can... And, Obviously, that's a fairly intrusive surgery, um, and every time you do it, there's chances of more and more complications arising from it. So here's a hip replacement. So I mentioned I'd bring this up. Let's so I can get my pen to work for me here. Come on, pen. All right. So we talk about someone had, like especially an elderly individual, breaking their hip. What we're talking about is not the hip bone. Right, that's that's not what gets damaged. Usually, where the break occurs is right in in the neck 
of the femur. So usually the break occurs right here. Although certainly it can, it can occur in different places. However, that tends to be the, the commonmost point. Um, so what they end up doing, you kind of see this here in this, in this x-ray, in this radiograph. Um, so here you see the artificial acetabulum. It gets inserted into the socket. Um, and then they drive the shaft of that artificial femur down into the actual bone. Uh, and these days, you usually get a hip replacement. You come out of anesthesia. They give you a little bit, and then they have you up and walking around. Um, one of the things you've probably heard of, like when, when elderly individuals break their hip, it was almost like a death sentence. Um, and part of that was because the treatment not that long ago, really, even like 10 years ago, was that you, you got your hip replacement and they would leave you in bed for a long time, you know, weeks even. Now, the elderly, if they're left in bed for a long period of time, their muscles atrophy very quickly. So to the point where by the time the doctors decided that their hip had healed, their muscles had an atrophy to the point where it was actually very difficult to walk, even get out of bed. And so what really uh, claimed their lives was things like pneumonia would set in due to just simply lying on their back for such long periods of time. So these days, they basically, you've got your hip replacement, boom, they have you up and walking around and doing physical therapy as soon as possible. So in that way, you're not laying in bed all day, muscles are not atrophying, um, and then you're, you're less likely to contract any kind of like lung disorder that will kill you. Oops, let's see if I can get rid of my pen now. Oh, apparently not. All right, so techniques have gotten quite a bit better. Um, so these days, like if you need to have cartilage being replaced, um, one, again, depends on, on what the situation is. This, this is obviously not going to work for every situation. Um, however, what they can do is they can actually remove chondrocytes from you, grow them in a Petri dish, and then try to replace them in the actual damaged joint. Or sometimes they'll even insert stem cells into that joint to help stimulate them to replace the cartilage. Um, again, this will depend on the individual. Sometimes this works. Some people are very good candidates for this. Sometimes they're not very good candidates for this. It'll just depend on all the other underlying medical factors uh, that would make you a candidate for that kind of surgery versus sort of an artificial knee replacement, which is very similar to a hip replacement, except um, basically what they do is they take off the top of that tibia, they put a metal uh, piece in there, and those condyles on the femur, they'll take those off and they'll put metal, sort of like a Teflon metal uh, implants in there. And then so you have that as your joint. Um, so let's talk about a couple of diseases and disorders. I'll hide me here. Um, there should be an R in front of that. So that should be an RH. So rheumatoid arthritis. So when we're talking about rheumatoid arthritis, that's an autoimmune disorder. So basically what's going on is that your cartilage is being attacked um, by your actual immune system. Something's gone awry and your immune system, for whatever reason, can't recognize you as you and it's, and it's attacking your cartilage. So what ends up happening is you have lots of um, inflammation, um, and with inflammation comes swelling and pain. And one of the things to remember when you have that, when you have any kind of inflammation in a joint or anywhere around bone, the only thing bone knows how to do is make more bone. So it tries to, to handle the inflammation by making more bone, by encapsulating whatever it is in bone. Well, this is not a good idea in a joint because you don't want more bone because then you're going to fuse that joint. So if you've ever seen someone with rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of times their hands are sort of gnarled looking or even their feet. Um, and bas basically what's happened, you can kind of see it on this x-ray, instead of having a nice clean joint like that, you have all this extra bone growth. By having that bone growth, it's pushing on the joint, so the fingers are starting to get deformed, right? Um, very painful, um, debilitating. Um, you know, and one of the hallmarks, another hallmark of rheumatoid arthritis, is that it's going to attack these small joints first. Okay? It tends not, tends not to attack large joints. So you'll, you'll see these in small finger joints first, and then maybe as, as the disease progresses, if there's no medication given for it, you may end up seeing it in like larger joints like shoulder, hip. Um, but rheumatoid usually starts in small joints. Again, and it's an autoimmune disorder. It has nothing to do with wear and tear. 
On the other hand, osteoarthritis is something that we, we, if we all live long enough, we'll all get to look forward to. Get old enough, and as we had mentioned, things simply wear down. They don't, they're not built at the same speed as they once were. They, you know, they just kind of wear out as well. Um, so basically, this is simply degenerative. It's due to wear and tear. So there's no inflammation, no swelling. So you really don't have that um, bony growth that you would have seen in, in the rheumatoid arthritis. Cartilage is being affected. That synovial membrane is not. Um, ever so often as that cartilage uh, deteriorates, you may end up having a bone spur. So you'll have like in that particular spot where the bone is being irritated, it'll grow like a little sort of sliver of bone or a little bump of bone. Um, and obviously that can be really painful. So any, anything, any, again, anytime you, your joint is not nice and smooth, um, it'll be painful, it'll restrict movement, right, because the bones can't move against one another like they once did. Um, a lot of times people who have osteoarthritis, it's painful when they first wake up because they've been sleeping all night long, presumably. Um, and remember that synovial fluid, if you have, don't move it, it's not being produced at the same rate, and it's also more viscous. So as soon as you get up, you start moving, you start producing more synovial fluid, which will help aid that joint in nice gliding movement, as well as that fluid becomes more uh, smooth, so it, again, it'll, it'll help with that friction and the shock, shock absorption better. So basically that pain, after you start moving around, goes away. Okay. And usually, because this is wear and tear, your larger joints, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly the weight-bearing joints, or any joint really that you may have overused for whatever reason, will be the ones that start seeing the osteoarthritis first. So you might see it in a shoulder, you might see it in a knee, you might see it in the hip, but you won't see it in your fingers like you did the rheumatoid. There's another type of arthritis called gouty arthritis or simply gout. You may have heard of it. Basically what ends up happening is you have something known as, as urate crystal or crystals of urate, I should say. Um, build up in your joints. Now, urate is simply a waste product from DNA and RNA metabolism, so your body breaking down DNA and RNA. And if you are unable to process that waste product properly, what ends up happening is that it's going to build up in the bloodstream and then makes its way to the, into cartilage, and particularly if cartilage meets bone, it, it's deposited there, it's laid down there. And this, these crystals are like shards of glass, is what they look like. Um, so obviously, if you have these sh like sharp little crystals in a joint, they're going to cause irritation, which will lead to inflammation, swelling. And as soon as you have inflammation, again, bone only knows how to deal with that by building more bone. So basically, bones start fusing. Now, this particular type of arthritis tends to affect middle-aged men um, more so than any other group. And they would have to have an abnormal gene that uh, prevents them from uh, properly processing the urate so that it ends up forming these crystals. And for some reason, the, the joint that is sort of the hallmark for our, this gouty arthritis is that joint right at the base of the big toe. So you know, kind of on your foot, like where you're right at the base of your big toe, it kind of bulges out. That's, that's where you're going to start seeing this. And so here's this, it's in the lithograph from, I forget when, 1600s or something like that. And, you know, here's this little demon guy um, attacking this guy's foot. So sort of like pain of gout is what it was entitled. And here's a, a x-ray of that. So you, you can, you can, hopefully you can kind of see this really clearly here. Um, so right at that base, that big toe, you can see like all of this, these fragments of bone. I mean, you can imagine how painful that is. And again, bone, when it decides like it's going to tackle inflammation by building more bone, it doesn't build it all nice and smooth. I mean, these are fairly painful sort of random shards of bone um, being deposited at the base of that big toe. All right, so that's the end of that lecture. Um, again, if you have any, happen to have any questions for me, I know this is one of the longer ones, um, feel free, lab, email me. I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. All right, see you next time.